Well, thanks to the organisers first for letting me talk about this. And also thanks to Carl and Maria, because he's done most of the hard work in defining some stuff that I'm going to be using as well, so I feel the difficult questions about it, so that's good. So firstly, what I'm going to do is I'll try and motivate uh, why we should be interested in these things, and what exactly I mean by this title. So firstly, the structure of comp computation. So I think uh, this is a really part of, important part of the foundations of quantum theory, because it's one of the three kind of key areas where I think there's a real departure in quantum theory from classical physics. The other two being uh, non-locality and contextuality. Um, but I think the first two of these are very well studied and have been for a long time, but I think really trying to understand where this computational speed up comes from um, is a bit overlooked in comparison to the others. And so we've turned our attention to this. So what we really want to know, we want to know what actually provides this computational speed up. But also, why isn't there more of a speed up? I mean, you might think uh, that a quantum computer should be able to solve NP complete problems, or you might not. But there's, we want to know some reason why uh, why there's not more of a speed up than this. And then, if we can get some sort of deeper understanding about these things, then can we use this to design optimal algorithms or to do new tasks that we couldn't otherwise by knowing really what the bounds are and where they come from? So, why would we want to study this from physical principles rather than in the usual way of doing things? So, I'd argue that kind of the usual way for looking at this kind of thing is to start with the standard quantum formalism of Hilbert spaces and unitary operators, and from this try and derive some features of interest, so some bounds on computation or some tasks that you can do. But then if you want to say what's really the physics behind this, what physically is letting us achieve these things, then you've sort of got a big mess in the standard formalism between the mathematical tools and the different elements of physics that all sort of tie together. And it's very hard to extract the different ones from each other and say what's really physical <coughs> here, but what's just some mathematical <coughs> consequence of the theory. So then various people have gone sort of further than this and they've taken some bunch of physical principles in some framework and managed to reproduce the standard quantum formalism and so you get all of your standard results out of this. So I mean there's many reconstructions in the generalized probabilistic theory framework. Um, uh, and so arguably you can then say that these features of interest that we've got in quantum theory ultimately just derive from these physical principles. But then we still have the issue that all of these different bits of the physics are still kind of tangled up. It's difficult to say, is some feature that we've got, is it due to entanglement, or is it due to interference, or contextuality? And at different times, various uh, things to do with computation have all been put down to these different things. So if we're wanting to really understand where the computational power comes from with quantum theory, it's useful to try and disentangle these uh, different concepts. So to do that, we take this sort of external perspective, where we just go directly from the physical principles to whatever we care about. And this achieves two things. One thing it does is it means we can look at a broader class of theories that satisfy these physical principles. We might not need all of the physical principles that we need to get quantum theory back. Uh, so then there's other theories we can contrast with quantum theory to, and we can start to vary these physical principles to really get to grips with what exactly it is uh, that's obvious for whatever we care about. So to give an analogy that people might be a bit more familiar with is the study of non-local correlations. So an important question is why are uh, quantum correlations non-local in the sense of violating Bell inequalities? But they're not more non-local. We can't get PR box strength correlations in nature. And so to do this, you can take this external perspective and you can propose this principles such as information causality, which then lets you drive things like Sillson's bound, which starts to get some idea about why we expect uh, quantum theory to be bound in this way, and why it isn't so bad that we uh, are non-local, but it's still kind of constrained in some way. And then the useful thing that comes out of this are new protocols like device independence and ideas to do with that. that show that this isn't just a sort of foundational uh, idea, but it can have practical spin-offs as well. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to introduce the physical principles that I'm going to consider in terms of trying to reproduce uh, standard notions of computation within a more general framework. So from those physical principles, we derive some uh, components of computation that I'll get onto in a minute. And then from that, we can look at the class of theories that satisfy these physical principles and look at Grove's algorithm and try and uh, look at can we start to identify what's uh, giving the computational speed up. So 
firstly, the physical principles. We have causality, which has been discussed to death in this conference. So, uh, but, I mean, we, as everyone now knows, it's uh, information goes from the past to the future, not vice versa. Then we have purification that has just been described as well, and purity preservation as well. Uh, and to me, this is just some sort of statement about the on the underlying level, you can view the world as uh, just being reversible interactions. Then we have strong symmetry and the existence of pure and perfectly distinguishable states. And uh, this is the idea that you can encode some classical information into your system. And all different systems that can encode the same amount of classical information are, in some sense, equivalent. So mathematically, uh, it's the causality can be stated in terms of this thing, which is the unique deterministic effect. I use that notation, but it's exactly the same as what we saw in the previous talk. Uh, purification says that for every mixed state rho, there's some dilation to a bipartite state, uh, psi of rho, such that when you trace it out, uh, you get uh, back to the original state, and this psi is a pure state. And moreover, if you have two purifications, this psi and this phi, uh, that are both purifications of rho, then uh, they're related by a reversible transformation. Then strong symmetry says that if we have these two sets, well, firstly, that there exists this set of uh, pure and perfectly distinguishable states, by which we mean that there's some effect j, such that they pick out uh, which uh, state ally you have with certainty. And then if you have two such sets of uh, pure and perfectly distinguishable states, then there's a reversible transformation T that relates the two of them. So, again, as we heard in the previous talk, uh, real and fermionic uh, quantum theory both satisfy all of these axioms, along with standard quantum theory, obviously. So, we know there are other theories that satisfy these, and so we can start to explore uh, uh, other features of uh, these theories. And there's really no reason to think that we should uh, be just limited to these examples. There's nothing that constrains the order of interference uh, in these theories, at least not obviously. So uh, what do I mean by high-world interference? This has become important later on in the talk, but I'll define it now. Basically, in quantum theory, we have the idea of standard interference, which says that if we have some two-slit experiment and look at the interference pattern produced by this, and then you block off one of the slits in the experiment and look at the interference produced by that, and then block off the other one and look at the, uh, the pattern on the screen, then the sum of the two slit pattern, one slit pattern, sorry, is not the same as the two slit pattern. And this is what we mean by interference. But there's an interesting feature of quantum theory. So again, it's another one of these things where you have quantum theory has this strange feature, but then it's limited in some way. And that limitation can be diagrammatically put like this, which says that if you have a three slit experiment, then it can be written as the sum of all of the two-slit experiments minus the sum of the one-slit experiments because you've got some sort of overcamping going on from the two slits. So this is what it means for a theory not to have third-order interference. And you can show that if it doesn't have third-order interference, then it doesn't have any high-order interference. Uh, so if that was a not equal sign there, then this theory w would have third-order interference. And so you can characterize a theory by its order of interference, which all just, it's just an integer, but we label it H. So, given these physical principles, the causality, strong symmetry, and purification, then we can get various features of computation that are used all the time. So we can start to really compare quantum theory to this uh, broader framework of theories by starting to provide some of these tools. So the first one that we can show exists are reversible control transformations. So they're Defined like this, you have some, this is the control transformation here, and you have some set of pure and perfectly distinguishable states i, and if you send them into the control channel, then uh, some uh, transformation, reversible transformation ti, happens on the target system uh, coming out of some set here. So if uh, some transformation satisfies an equation like this, then we say it's a reversible control transformation. I mean, provided that it is actually reversible, that is, you can always get sort of the trivial case where you measure this system and then do something based on the results of that measurement, but that wouldn't be reversible in general, at least. So I thought I'd give some flavour of how this is derived. Uh, this isn't quite correct, but it's the general kind of core of the proof. So if we have this sort of cup thing, which I'm sure most people here are familiar with, which is just the generalised version of the Bell state, 
then if we just tensor it with one of the set of pure and perfectly distinguishable states, then this defines a new set of pure and perfectly sorry, this defines a set of pure and perfectly distinguishable states, so you can just measure the first system to distinguish them. And we're assuming good preservation, so the top set of these is again pure. And then if we just shove any transformation we want there, then that's again it's another pure and perfectly distinguishable set. And so strong symmetry says there should be some transformation taking us from one to the other. And then we can use ideas from the kind of categorical way of doing things and look at teleportation with this sort of picture. I just bend that wire back again and then shove a box around that and that gives you something that's kind of like a reversible control transformation. As I said, there's more details that, to, but this is kind of the, the core of the idea. Okay, so we've got them. We can also define what it means for reversible phase transformations, which are again another fairly standard part of computation in quantum theory that we use all the time. So we have some set of effects labeled by I that, again, a set of effects that pick out a set of pure and perfectly distinguishable states. And then a phase transformation is one that leaves the statistics of this measurement invariant. So whatever you plug in, whatever state you plug in on either side, you get the same probability out. And so this phase transformation is just preserving those statistics. And then in quantum theory, one of the key places where this emerges is in the phase kickback algorithm, which sits at the core of uh, at least all quantum algorithms that I really know about. And it's sort of the heart of many of them. And, uh, uh, again, I'll get onto Grove's algorithm in a bit, but it's really what's playing an important role there. So, by the phase kickback algorithm, what we mean is that you have some state S, which is a joint eigenstate of all of the TIs in the control transformation. And then when you send that into the target channel, rather than the transformation occurring to that, you instead see that some phase transformation happens on the control system. So you've intuitively you think that I'm controlling on the first system and doing something to the second system, but then in the particular setup that you can get in quantum theory, instead you see that nothing happens to your target system but something happens to the control system instead. Sorry, just briefly. That control transformation is a coherent one. So the controlling system is also a coherent system, it's a quantum system, and you just pick the basics. Yeah, yeah. so this, this is all, this is again a reversible control transformation yeah. rather than a check transformation. So now that we have these tools, uh, which, as I said, they come directly from those three physical principles. You don't need to assume anything else. There's no input of quantum theory here, you don't need to uh, talk about Hilbert spaces and unitary operators, it's just directly from these physical principles you get these ideas out. So we want to explore, now that we have this set of theories that have these nice properties, what can we say about them? And so we looked at Grove's algorithm because, well, it's one of the first uh, quantum algorithms anyone ever learns about, and it kind of, again, forms the core of many other algorithms talks about a search problem, which is a very generic problem uh, that's of interest to people, I suppose. But an important feature is that it's got a provable advantage over quantum theory. You can show that cla over classical theory, sorry. Uh, so quantum theory can do better than classical theory can. And moreover, we've got uh, Grover's algorithm, which can provably optimal for quantum theory. So really, it's a very well-characterized problem, and we know a lot about it, so it seems like a suitable place to start exploring these other theories. And importantly, it's an oracle problem, which I'll explain what that means in a bit, but you heard about them this morning, what oracles were. Uh, but importantly, we can start to discuss oracles in the same way as you can in quantum theory, using some of these tools that we've developed. So if anyone doesn't know, I should state what the search problem actually is. It basically says that if you have some n element unstructured list, so you don't know anything about it, with one item that's marked. Then you have some oracle that knows which item is marked, and then you want to say how many queries this oracle are necessary to be able to find that marked item. So what do we mean by this oracle? So in quantum theory, the oracle is defined like this, or can be defined like this. It's some unitary transformation, this u of x here, such that this first system that you send into it is telling you which system, you, uh, which element of the list you're trying to query. So this is querying uh, element i of the list. And then the second uh, system just encodes the answer to whether that is the marked item or not. So if it is the marked item, sends it to an orthogonal state, and if it's not the marked item, it leaves it invariant. So you can measure that second system and know whether you queried the marked item or not. So diagrammatically, this just looks like this. It's just some controlled transformation. 
that based on whether you query the right thing or not, applies PowerX or not to the second system. But then for the particular solution of Grover's problem, you go to this other form where you have a phase transformation, where rather than encoding the information about whether you've got the marked item correct in a state, you encode it in, sorry, in like the computational basis of some state, you instead encode it in the phase information. And you can go between these two pictures by using the phase kickback algorithm. So here, if you send in the just standard computational basis state one, then it's an eigenstate of x, and so it's left invariant by all of them. So you get some phase kickback on the top system, and then you can discard your second system without uh, making anything mixed, and so you just get this phase transformation here. So this is what's used in Grover's algorithm to uh, show that you've got the computational speed up. So then, now we have all of these tools that reverse the control transformations, we can generalize this to the general case of these other things. So we can define an article in terms of control transformation, where these transformations here depend on uh, which is the marked item, or equivalently we can go to the like, phase transformation picture using this idea of a uh, phase kickback algorithm. So then in Grover's theorem, uh, Grover's theorem, Grover's algorithm, uh, or the search form generally, you can show that classical computers <coughs> will need uh, n queries to be able to solve this problem. Whereas on a quantum computer, the key result is that they need only square root 10. So this is what I mean by the quantum speed up for this particular problem. But it's important to know that this is all relative to the oracle. It's not a generic search problem. It's uh, you have this oracle and you're querying it and you want to know how many queries it takes. So then we want to know what causes this speed up. What's the key feature here that's doing it? And one uh, proposal has been that it's really interference between computational paths. You have the different paths, and you can query things in superposition, and then it's interference between these paths, but then lets you get more information out about the oracle than you could just by querying the individual paths separately. So we want to know, does quantum interference provide the speed up? And then one way to look at this is to say, well, if we have more interference, in the sense of this high order interference, does this provide more of a speed up than uh, you could get otherwise? Um, I my guess was that you'd have something like this, that rather than a square root speed up, you'd get a uh, 1 over h uh, powered speed up, where h is the order of interference. And the important intuition behind this is really the connection between <coughs> interference and phases, uh, which lets this make a bit more sense. So we have this sort of picture of an interference experiment. You have two slips, you send in some source, it goes through the slips, and you look on the screen to see the interference pattern. But in quantum theory, you can look at an equivalent uh, experiment where you have some inputs, you have some beam splitter, and then you control this phase between them here. So this is like a phase transformation at this point. And then rather than looking along the screen, you just measure uh, the probability of being found on one output. And so this gives a very <coughs> close connection between the ideas of interference and the ideas of phase. And because we can see the growth algorithm really relies on the phase kickback sort of idea, then if we have high order interference, you can equivalently define things high order phases, which then uh, seem like they should be of an advantage. So our main result of this is that, uh, surprisingly, uh, any computer that satisfies these principles, still you get the same lower bound. So rather than being a change in the power here, it's just uh, divided by h, which then asymptotically is irrelevant. So just from these physical principles alone, you can get the same uh, bound in a device, uh, device in a theory independent sort of way. And surprisingly, uh, this high order interference idea doesn't seem to give any computational advantage. So we can sort of question whether interference is even kind of the key thing in quantum theory or whether we should really be looking for some other source of the speed up. So to conclude, um, we have these uh, three physical principles. And from, just from those alone, we can get some of the basic features of computation. Uh, we can get the reversible control transformations, we can get phase transformations, and we can get a generalized phase kickback algorithm. And then we can show that in a theory-independent way, just from these physical principles and using these tools that we've developed, you can retrieve the quantum lower bound. So the square root 10 speed up is optimal for all of these things. But, I mean, there's valid questions to ask about do we need all of these principles, really? Uh, in particular, 
the purification postulate rules out classical theory, and classical theory obviously should has things like reversible control transformations. So imposing the purification postulate seems like it's probably too strong, and there should be some weakening of it. We saw in the previous talk as well that this was used to get ideas about thermodynamics, and uh, classical theory has a good theory of thermodynamics. So again, it seems like maybe there's some weakening of this principle. And then another important question is, can we actually reach this lower bound? We've shown that this lower bound exists for all of these theories, but can we actually find some algorithm using the reversible control transformations, phase kickback, and all of that? Can we actually find an algorithm that does this in these other theories, or is this non-leachable bound? And finally, are there any practical applications that we can get from this? Now that we've uh, started to be able to talk about computation in this broader class of theories, can we do anything roughly like the device independent stuff that came out of non locality? Okay, right, that's it. Thank you. theory, I guess, to the structure of the phase group. I guess not a complete characterization, but some So the, some the nicest characterization, given these uh, particular principles, the nicest characterization is in terms of the structure of the state space. Uh, and you can kind of, like in quantum theory, you can divide up the state space into sort of the diagonal element density matrix and then the off-diagonal elements. And then the off-diagonal elements are kind of coherences between the different levels. Uh, given these principles, you can do a similar sort of thing uh, where you also get sort of like off-off diagonal elements that link the off diagonal elements together and this kind of thing. And then the phase group really should look like uh, you'll have a bunch of transformations that lead various bits of its invariance, and then if you've got enough structure, then you should have uh, transformations that just affect like the third order terms or just affect the second order terms. And so that should all come out in the structure of the phase group. But then you really have to start talking about a specific theory. You can't just stay in this general framework. You have to uh, say, for a particular theory that has high order interference, then uh, what's the phase group? But it should, if it satisfies these principles and you have a theory with high order interference, then the phase group should have some nice structure, basically. So, um, I guess some of us can project themselves more easily than others into the beautiful situation where we don't know the physical principles mm -hmm. and we calculate the complexity of, of Grover's algorithm just by doing the math. Yeah. Yeah. And it looks like the only reason why, why, and the only place where he gets the speed up is the fact that, that we're using L2 norm, whereas in classical probability we're using L1 norm. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, then I'm wondering what you know. In a, in, in a sense, it, it, it looks like we're we're looking at the the reason why we're getting this speed up, which is which is also maximal, mm. might be the, the story that already von Neumann told that there are you know L1 and L infinity in, in one world and just L2 in the other world, mm. and there are no, I mean the, the, these multi-slit experiments are not taking us to LP norm, or are they? I mean. They're not exactly, but there's, if, in, in some sense, uh, the nearest physical theory, physical in the sense of not allowing for signaling and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. that you can get to that uh, sort of idea. So if you just change the norm you have, then in general that will lead to signaling and uh, it won't be a kind of uh, signaling. Uh -huh. um, I see. Uh, so then it doesn't fit in this framework of generalized probabilistic things. But the, this idea of high order inference is kind of the nearest you can get to that while still having a sort of well-defined theory. So that, that's where the intuition comes from, is that uh, it uh, seems like, as you say, it's the power of two that's doing all of the work, and this is the nearest you can get to changing that. Anyone else? Thanks again. <laughs>